some long time. You, know, you can imagine in an island this small, you don't take to the hills uh, guns in hand. Uh, the first really significant thing we did was um, du during 1942, the fortifications started to be built on the island uh, to form part of, the, of Hitler's famous Atlantic Wall and thousands of uh, slave workers were brought here by the organization TOT, who organized workers for such military uh, uh, installations. Firstly came Spanish Republicans, who were the remnants of the Northern Army of the Spanish Republic, who'd retreated into France, and then Pet had handed over to the Germans in some kind of deal. Um, they were followed quite rapidly by a very large number of teenagers from the Soviet Union, uh, mostly Ukrainians, mostly in their teens. Some were uh, prisoners of war and therefore older. And they were followed by some Czechs, Poles, Yugoslavs, various different nationalities plus a, a large contingent of Algerian prisoners of war. And the conditions under which these people lived and worked were absolutely deplorable. And that roused us into uh, thinking of some kind of uh, uh, opposition to that sort of thing. The first thing that uh, really uh, uh, caused us to be able to take some action was that some of the Soviet youngsters started breaking from the camps at night and walking east. They didn't know they were on an island. And uh, uh, they thought if they walked east at night, they'd get home. Uh, and of course they didn't. <laughs> they came to the sea and could go no further. Um, they were hidden by a fairly large number of local residents who took pity on them, stowed away in farms and places like that, but some in urban situations, and the people uh, sheltering them were short of food themselves, quite obviously, and our first move was to uh, arrange a sort of network of food and clothing for these chaps. Um, that was the first thing we did, was um, that help network. Because, uh, you know what gossip in a small island like this is, we got to know of several hiding places. And, uh, in fact, there was one of them, uh, Mikhail Krohin, who uh, walked around the town quite openly and knew where a lot of the others were, and he was our... Uh, method of distributing what we could collect. Then there was a typhus outbreak in one of the camp, Lager Udet, and that scared the pants off the garrison. Uh, and they decided to clean up the camps, deal out them and so on. And they took a group of Spanish Republicans out of the camps who'd had, being ex-army people, who'd had some kind of first aid experience and uh, um, an actual doctor who was in one of the camps here, a Spanish doctor. And they set up this OT hospital in the girls college in Rushville where they uh, uh, had, as I say, a de-lousing squad and uh, uh, some attempt at um, uh, pulling out of the camps people dying of dysentery and took them into this hospital, as it was called. And uh, the Spanish medical orderlies uh, employed there were then not exactly free men, but allowed to wander the, the town in their off-duty uh, times. And there were also some civilian orderlies working in that hospital. And through one of these locals, uh, we found that... W when I say we, I'm talking about the Jersey Communist Party. We found that there was some, uh, a little communist group amongst these Spanish orderlies. And uh, we had a meeting with them one Sunday afternoon. 
and it was agreed that um, while they were in and out of the various camps they could easily be taking in uh, brief news bulletins to keep morale up in the camps because this is after, I'm talking now, when the Germans had started the long retreat on the Eastern Front, you know, after Stalingrad. Um, so there was good news to uh, disperse amongst the camps. Uh, well, this brings me to the second part of what we did, really, because tail end of 1944, uh, through, again, uh, information going the other way, we found there was a group of soldiers organising towards a mutiny in the garrison, and uh, we managed to find them and work with them in the moves towards... Uh, a mutiny, which included getting, providing them with leaflets, uh, calling for a mutiny, uh, helping. We helped one soldier when he decided he could do more work as a deserter than in the garrison. We managed to get him clothing, civilian clothing, a bicycle, a cottage in which to live, uh, and so on. So we were an active part of the mutiny campaign. So after liberation, when the soldier, Mulbach, gave himself up, there was, um, with the incoming troops, the day after Liberation Day, uh, an MI post was set up here, a military intelligence post, and Mulbach surrendered himself to them. He surrendered himself to them and gave them his story of the mutiny campaign and his uh, connections with Les Hewlin, who was the secretary of the party uh, group, and myself, who'd been our, our liaison with Mulbach. I was the specific liaison with the mutiny campaign. And we made statements to the this MI officer, supporting what Paul was saying, uh, you know, uh, uh, saying we knew of this man, what what he said he'd done, he had done to our knowledge, and you know, we made formal statements, in other words, and uh, that cleared Paul from uh, uh, sort of spinning yarns, <laughs> and uh, we also made statements uh, at a later stage, both Les and I, and several other people who knew what had been going on to the civil affairs unit that replaced the military intelligence post. And uh, we gave quite considerable information in statements. Uh, and, you know, nothing was ever done about any of this. What kind of information was in the statement? Uh, our uh, feeling uh, uh, of collaboration by people in high places. Uh, we were asked we were grilled almost, if I can, uh, not unpleasantly, but uh, <coughs> we were um, questioned quite closely about all sorts of things that we knew had happened. I suspect that some of our statements at least are in this uh, uh, secret file that seems to be in, in the hands of the UK government. But um, nothing ever happened. Uh, it was all stowed away, filed away and forgotten, presumably.